president of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. We're based out in uh, Boulder, Colorado, which is not 98 today. It's a little bit cooler than that. Um, thank you for being such a warm introduction for us here. Um, we're a consortium of 105 of the leading universities across the US and Canada that both educate and carry out basic research on weather, hurricanes being part of weather, uh, air quality, climate, water issues, and yes, even space weather. I don't know if any of you had a chance to see all the excitement about the aurora moving south these last few days. That's part of our portfolio. Since 1960, we's, we've also operated the National Center for Atmospheric Research, uh, also in Boulder, Colorado, which is the largest, the oldest, and the broadest in terms of mission of the National Science Foundation's federally funded research and development centers. So this is the second in our briefings that we're bringing to the Hill to try to bring science to you, science you can use, and science that can help you in the work you're doing. Um, our topic today is going to be on hurricanes, and the structure is that we have three distinguished panelists here who will spend about 10 minutes um, giving you some highlights of what they know about hurricanes and what they'd like to know. And then we've got 30 minutes wide open for you to ask whatever questions um, you may have, like why they name storms, how they name them, or anything else that, that may be on your mind. Um, I'm going to say very little by way of introduction except to say that in, in a real sense, um, hurricanes are nature's most amazing spectacle. Um, they are clearly the greatest show on Earth. If you were a, a hypothetical astronomer living on Mars with uh, even a fairly modest telescope, you would be able to see hurricanes very easily on the Earth, that pinwheel pattern of clouds. You'd see them form, you'd see them evolve, you'd see them move over land. Um, they are amazing objects. The speed of the winds within hurricanes can actually be greater than one-third the speed of sound. That's huge. Uh, in one hour, hurricanes can drop half a foot of water on a location, and that's a tremendous impact. Of course, as the picture shows behind me, the impacts that we really care about are really the heartbreak, the loss, the tragic impacts that hurricanes have, not just on our lives, many are lost, but also our livelihoods. Recovering from hurricanes represent a huge impact on our planet. And it's, you'll see from our speakers, it's not just limited to the Gulf Coast states or the states that border the ocean, but the impacts can be quite a ways inland. Um, we're really uh, fortunate to have three of uh, the leading researchers in the area of hurricanes with us. Um, Professor Shui Chen is from the uh, the uh, Rasmus School down at the University of Miami. Um, she's going to be our lead off speaker. Following her will be Professor Sitska Kimball from the University of South Alabama. And finally, bringing up the rear of our presentations will be um, Dr. Chris Davis from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. They're each going to talk for about 10 minutes, and I'd ask that you hold your questions for the 30 minutes at the end, unless it's just to clarify a point or something you don't get. So without further ado, um, Shui, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. Um, as Tom said, hurricanes is one of these most beautiful, powerful cre uh, creatures that Mother Nature created on Earth. Whom in this room does not love to look at those images, right? Yet on the other side, hurricane can be very devastating, projecting the impact on society. So with that, I'm going to start um, talk about since 2005, Hurricane Katrina became the most costly storm in the US history and uh, caused more than 1,800 deaths and more than 100 billion in damage. 2012, Hurricane Sandy became the second most costly storm. And that memory and the scars of these hurricane damage still fresh. Um, the National Research Council has been calling for a greater uh, paradigm shift from weather forecasting to the uh, hurricane explicit for, uh, impact forecasting. 
So my research ever since Katrina has been centered on the hurricane for impact forecast as most of the research community. So these progress has been made over the last decade cannot be done without the support of agencies like the National Science Foundation for basic research and the field campaigns. Uh, the picture on your left it's a photo taken inside of Hurricane Katrina on an airplane uh, P3 during a research program called RENEX I was involved in. Um, we studied that storm in much details, greater details than we have ever been, and we learned a lot from that. And the image to the left, uh, to the right, is a Hurricane Sandy from taken from space. Next. Now, traditionally, when we think of a hurricane impact, we often relate to the uh, numbers like hurricane intensity, defined as peak winds, um, as the categories. As it turned out, hurricane impact are not simply determined by those parameters, as you will see. To the left, as you are fully aware of, Hurricane Katrina was major hurricane category three hurricanes, and the produced a huge amount of um, flooding. And also storm surge wiped out the entire neighborhood, as you see in those pictures. And yet, if you look to the right, Hurricane Sandy was barely category one storm. But the damage is no less. Um, not only produced a huge amount of flooding in New York City, and also have heavy snow at the same time in West Virginia the storm become much more complex, and so are we. Research follow these complex aspects, building tools we can do impact forecast. So let's bring us to look at the current hurricane forecast. We are, in operational sense, still looking, focus on the, uh, where the storm is gonna make in landfall. To the left, it's an image showing you the um, multi-model ensemble forecast made by three major meteorological centers um, for Hurricane Sandy in seven, five, and three days in advance. So I can, you can see the, um, the red color represent the NOAA um, NCEP GFS model. The green represent the European Center model and then the blue are the UK Met Office model. So at the beginning, seven days ahead of time, the model tend to be diverse, has more uncertainty. And it's that impact the forecast by the Hurricane Center, which is the national official forecast to the right. On Tuesday 23rd, the storm was actually uh, made forecast toward uh, east over the sea because a lot of model uncertainty. But then as time getting closer, model become a much more definitive, and so is official forecast. So again, uh, these forecasts focus on the intensity and the track. As you will see next, um, that in fact, Hurricane Sandy is much more complex. Hurricane Sandy was no ordinary hurricane. As you know, that later been named a superstorm for a reason because Sandy uh, interacted with a mid-latitude mid storm, that the two storms, the one to the upper left corner is the mid-latitude storm, and the one in the south is Sandy. The two wrap around each other and uh, join force and created this super storm. So this animation you're looking at is made by a weather model called WARF, which is open source weather forecasting model developed by the research community more than 15 years ago. And then now it becomes state of arts of hurricane forecasting. And as you can see, these complex interactions require model to resolve these features. Next. So now from that things in the air, now getting down to the surface. The research community has been building these forecast model, not only forecasting hurricanes in the air, but really the impact on the ground, 
near the surface and can be down to the street level. So to the left, that image shows the uh, sea surface height elevation. The color indicating 10 foot uh, in red, that's above sea level, and the blue is 10 foot uh, depression normally. And uh, to the right is an image and an animation showing the hurricane generated uh, high surface waves. So as hurricane approaching to land, the strong winds pushes waves toward the coast, especially on the right side. So that strong winds pulling the waves ahead of storm that tend to uh, produce a phenomenon called wave setup. So if you were in DC more than 10 years ago, you may have remembered Hurricane Isabel. Isabel pushed the water several days ahead into Chesca Bay before the storm rise and arrives and also the uh, Potomac River flooded before the storm even arrived. So these are can be forecast with this most up-to-date, fully interactive um, atmosphere wave and ocean model developed, this particular one developed at the University of Miami. And if you look to the left again, that sea surface anomaly indicating how much water we're expecting near the coast. As you can see to the right side of a storm, because of the wave set up and also the wind forcing, we have uh, more than 10 foot of sea level rise going to Jersey shores and the New York area. On the Chess Bay area, you can see that blue color. In fact, the wind pulling water out of Chess Bay. These storms has great impact on very, very large area. So now um, we can zoom in even further to the street level. This really is a great testimony that where the research has come along over the last decade. This particular one um, to the right shows you the elevation of the New York City um, Manhattan area. And the red indicating zero to blue about 112, uh, 120 foot elevation. The brown color shows the uh, state of art of storm surge model called ETSER that is provided by the, our colleagues from uh, Stony Brook uh, University. As you can see, the model predicted flooding in this area coming to the street level with much more details than what we had in the past, down to uh, 60 foot resolution. To your left, we're having a great gauge network that in fact is the best in the world, measure the uh, water level during Sandy. So you can see a lot of these regions in the Manhattan area that reported flooding matches very well with the storm surge forecast. So that's how far the research community has come along. And uh, I would like to conclude this part of the presentation with a few thoughts with you. Well, First, um, to meet society needs, we have to. We really have to make sure we can do explicit impact. That's a must. We have to go forward with that. Research community already leading the way. Um, we also need the best possible observations in the air, land, and the sea to evaluating these state art models and to feed into these models in order having them to have the best possible initial conditions to make the forecast that we need. And then third, we need to also have the models running in the ensemble mode like many of these model runs, so can provide a probabilistic information to the forecast of the impact, which is absolutely need. That's the nature of the system that is in probabilistic in nature. One of the very challenging and important issue is how can we best move these research results into operations? That's where the rubber meets road. We really need that level of a transition, make it as best possible transition we can to make it useful. So lastly, these hurricane um, has driven research community to develop a lot of new technology innovations 
that these fully interactive ocean, land, and uh, air coupled model can actually help us to make the uh, coastal planning and the management, and also emergency management in this uh, hurricane event. But furthermore, we can actually have these tools for near term and the long term risk assessment. Because going forward in a changing climate, that for instance, sea level rises become a really threat to many coastal cities. And these tools can help us doing long term assessment. So hurricane community needs your help. Together we can do great things. Thank you. With that, I'm going to turn into uh, uh, turn to uh, Dr. Siska Campbell from University of South Alabama. Thank you very much, Shui. Um, next slide, please. Um, just like people, not all hurricanes look the same. The two images that you see here are from two hurricanes, both Category 3 at the time the image was taken, and you can clearly see differences. Some storms are large, some storms are small. Some storms, like Wilma here on the left, has, have two eye walls. You can clearly see um, two concentric rings of yellows and reds in that storm. That particular storm is also relatively symmetric. The uh, yellows and reds are evenly distributed around the center, as opposed to Hurricane Ivan on the right, where the yellows and reds are concentrated in just one part of the eye wall. So all these properties together make up what we know as structure. And the structure of the storm is really critical because it tells us where most of the rain will fall and where the damaging winds will occur. Unfortunately, it's a complicated problem because there are many different factors that control what the structure of the storm is going to be. So we have internal processes like double eye wall formation. Then we have external factors that happen in the atmosphere around the storm. One of those being vertical wind shear, which is how the horizontal winds change with height. Another factor is dry air intrusion. When storms get closer to land, there's generally drier air located over land, and that air can then get wrapped up into the circulation of the storm and impact its structure. Lastly, when storms transition from the relatively smooth and uniform ocean surface to land, conditions under the storm suddenly change quite dramatically. The surface roughness will increase because now there's forests and buildings and so forth. Um, the moisture content is going to drop and becomes quite patchy. You'll have higher moisture content where there's marshy areas, and then you'll have lower moisture content um, in urban areas. And lastly, there's topography. So we'll have hills and valleys. So all those factors matter. And the critical thing is to tease out which factor is going to dominate when. And that is so complex that we rely on numerical models to do that for us. Thankfully, we've made a lot of progress with numerical modeling in recent years. And in a large part, that is thanks to what we call data assimilation. And that means that we put real data in the model before we run it out. And that leads to a better representation of the storm. So that has enabled us to better model low-level wind fields and precipitation in storms. Next, please. The image you see here is a Doppler radar image of winds moving towards and away from the radar. Like I said in the previous slide, when a hurricane approaches land, the roughness increases. So the winds at the lowest levels in the storm is going to decrease. Above that layer, what we call the boundary layer, the winds can remain, remain quite strong for quite some time after the storm reaches land and crosses into, into land. Um, an um, so the, another thing that happens when we reach land, the uh, circulation in the storm can generate up and downward motion. And these downward motion motions can push the stronger winds above the boundary layer down to the surface, leading to localized damage in wind or wind gusts. So overall, the storm intensity is going to go down when the storm makes landfall, but the wind gusts may actually get more, more strong. 
We've also learned from recent research that there are small scale structures in the boundary layer called streaks and rolls that contribute to these surface wind gusts. And if you look at the image, you can see these little filaments, and those represent the streaks and rolls that I just talked about. Next, please. Um, all hurricanes produce tornadoes when they make landfall. Some just do so a lot more than others. The image you see here is from Hurricane Ivan in 2004, which was a prolific producer of tornadoes. Um, we know that most of these tornadoes occur in the right front quadrant of the storm. So in this case, Ivan was moving to the north, and the right front quadrant is shown by the dashed red line. Um, these uh, storms, these tornadoes, are embedded in supercells. Those are seen as the uh, yellow and red dots in, embedded in the rain bands of the storm. And unfortunately, these are quite shallow, so the tornadoes are very difficult to see on radar, radar and therefore difficult to forecast. So we have to look at the larger environment to see if there's a potential for tornadoes. Now, we know that in the right front quadrant, we have vertical wind shear, which is an important ingredient for tornado formation. We also need thermodynamic instability. And that is controlled by, again, dry air intrusion, and specifically the height where the dry air intrusion occurs and the duration of it. Um, Recent research has pointed out that we could potentially use parameters that are used for um, Great Plains tornadoes to assess if there is potential for tornadoes in hurricanes. Next, please. Um, when hurricanes track inland, they can drop huge amounts of rainfall. And this can lead to devastating flooding and even landslides in mountainous areas and this has in the past caused billions of dollars of damage and has led to numerous fatalities. Very interestingly, there's limited published research out there on this topic. On the left of the slide, you can see the rain totals that were produced by Hurricane Ivan, which made landfall in Alabama in 2004 and then tracked northward and dropped rain all the way from Alabama to Maine. Now, this storm was preceded by Tropical Storm Bonnie and Hurricane Francis, which um, caused the soil moisture ahead of Ivan's track to be a lot more moist than it normally would have been without those storms. And that enhanced the rainfall that Ivan was able to produce. So increased soil moisture is an important factor to creating uh, large amounts of rainfall inland. Another important factor was pointed out by Shui here earlier, and that is interaction, interaction, <laughs> interaction with mid-latitude storms, like ha occurred with Sandy. Um, it's very import important to point out that the ability of a storm to produce rainfall and flooding is not well correlated with its intensity. There have been very weak storms, including tropical storms, that have produced devastating flooding. Um, recent research has focused on flooding produced by past storms, and the image on the bottom right illustrates this. The yellows that you see um, are flooding events that are equal to the maximum 10-year flood, so the maximum flooding that you can expect in 10 years. The uh, oranges and reds ex exceed this 10-year flood. So you can see that the eastern seaboard and Florida are very susceptible to hurricane flooding. But interestingly, there is a secondary swath going across the Midwest of the country and reaching states like Illinois, which would not normally expect impacts from hurricanes. So um, getting a large amount of rainfall during a period of drought can be very productive for agriculturist, ag agricultural interests in those, in those states. Um, conversely, if the flooding is very severe and the rainfall is very intense, it could wash away crops and it could be devastating. Um, next slide, please. Another factor that causes large rainfall to occur with hurricanes is called the predecessor rain event, or PRE. And this typically occurs hundreds of miles away from where the storm actually makes landfall. And you can see the statistics on the slide. These, these events, are by, events are by no means rare. The schematic that you see illustrates how this works. So you've got the circulation associated with the hurricane working with the subtropical high circulation. Together, these push very uh, moist air towards the northern parts of the country. And if conditions are right, 
this moist air will line up with the right jet entrance region where strong ascent happens, causing rainfall to form and large amounts of rain to drop in that area indicated. Um, next, please. And then finally, I want to point out the importance of high-density rain gauge networks. So um, the images that you see here compare um, different uh, maps of rainfall totals. Bottom left is a radar-derived rainfall total map, and this is for the case of Hurricane Ida, which made landfall in Alabama in 2009. The reds are where the highest rainfall totals happened with that storm. Now, if we use just the National Weather Service rain gauge network, we obtain the map that you see at the top right, which looks nothing like what you see on radar. And then if we use um, three additional networks to derive a rainfall totals map, it looks a lot more detailed, and we can see that it looks a lot more like what we see on radar, which for this particular exercise we'll assume as ground truth. So these, these networks are very important to us because they help us understand the hydrometeorology of flooding. So why does flooding happen in one location and not another? Why does it occur one day and not the next? So for instance, the Appalachian Mountains do not have a high density rain gauge network. So it's very difficult for us to understand how flooding happens there. And we saw earlier that flooding is quite common with, hur with hurricanes in those regions. Um, we also use high-density rain gauge networks to validate and improve our numerical weather models. We use them to val validate and calibrate um, remote sensing tools like radar and satellite. And lastly, we use um, high-density rain gauge networks for data assimilation, which is putting the data into the model to come to a better forecast. So in conclusion, I would like to say that, um, or mention or emphasize that having good observations really makes a difference on how our models can simulate and forecast hurricanes. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Chris Davis from the National Center of Atmospheric Research. Thank you, Siska. I'm going to talk about uh, advancing hurricane and track and intensity forecasts, a little bit about how we've progressed and where we're going. Uh, so to get an idea of how things have progressed in the last uh, 15 years or so, there's a graph. And this is courtesy of the National Hurricane Center. Now, we define track. It's a little bit misleading. The track you see as a, as a set of points that define the path of the storm. But Track verification is really verifying the position of, this, of the storm and defining the error in that position. And so what you see is in each of these curves, uh, they represent different lead times of hurricane forecasts, red for 24 hours, up to blue at five days. The slopes of these lines are all downward. That's good. That means the forecasts are getting better uh, since 1998. And the longer the lead time, the better the forecasts have, have become, or have, the more they've improved. Now, there's a horizontal line I've just added on here, which is the average radius of gale force winds in a tropical cyclone in the Atlantic. That's a surrogate for the size of the storm. What you can see is where that black line intersects those colored curves tells you at what lead time we can actually predict the location of the, of the storm within the size of the storm. In other words, the size of the storm is, tells you where the dam uh, over what extent the damage will occur or the, the high impact weather will occur. And we see we've gone from being able to, to uh, produce reasonably accurate forecasts at two days to now it's about at four days. This is a huge difference because now what it's saying is impact forecasts are possible out to three and four days. That's, that's a big difference be, uh, for evacuations and emergency management. So this is a really interesting time in, the, in hurricane prediction for forecasting impacts of hurricanes. But the impacts of hurricanes depend on accurate forecasts of the wind field. The wind field drives the surge, it drives the flooding, it drives the local damage when the storm reaches the coastline. Back uh, in, this is actually an animation of a forecast of Hurricane Isabel from 2003. And this is an example of how the research community was out in front of this problem doing high resolution forecasts at this time to capture the details of the wind field. The colors, which may be hard to see in the back, if you see uh, sort of pinks, that's category four uh, wind speeds uh, of 120 uh, miles an hour or so. 
as Isabel is making landfall. As Shui mentioned, this caused a, a, a large storm surge uh, in Chesapeake Bay and a lot of problems along the East Coast. Well, this, this was a real-time forecast done back in 2003, and this was a precursor to the high-resolution operational forecasts that are now routinely done by the Hurricane Wharf model that's run by the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Uh, so, ne next slide. But that is a single forecast. Now we know that the atmosphere, being a chaotic system, is not really well behaved all the time. If you, if you take two forecasts and you make one slightly different and you run them out, you may get two rather different answers. And that's just a property of the atmosphere that we're faced with. What this means is that we need to think about hurricane uh, impact forecasts. And in this particular example, I have shown hurricane uh, a wind probability field. We need to think about these in terms of probabilistic forecasts, not single deterministic forecasts. So it's a different mindset in some ways. Now, there are a lot of experimental products that are being created. Uh, again, the research community has been working on this for some time. This is an example of not just one, but a large number of high resolution forecasts that together allow us to say at any given point on that map, what is the probability of that point experiencing hurricane force winds, and in this case, during the passage of Hurricane Ike. So this is, uh, this, to do this, we need not only better use of the data in our models, which is, which Sitska has mentioned, uh, the way we incorporate those data, that's data assimilation, the models being better themselves, but we also need new strategies for how to create these ensembles of forecasts and how to communicate the information in these forecasts to decision makers and the public. Next slide. Now that kind of some exciting stuff that, that's going on in, in the research community. This is a look inside a hurricane at a really high resolution. So now we're talking about a, a resolution of around 200 feet. So we're getting down to individual building scales. And what you're seeing is the max is the wind field, which shows uh, yellow and red dots. Those are turbulent eddies. So we're getting now to be able to resolve turbulence in the eye wall of hurricanes. This is in research mode. Still, the, the, the operational predictions are not, are not there yet. But the interesting thing about resolving this turbulence is it tells us something about what the turbulence does to the larger storm. It actually feeds back onto the larger storm in some important ways. And it also, of course, gives us a, a tool to look at the detailed wind structure, structures that actually do the damage uh, in, in tropical cyclones. So, so this is an important uh, breakthrough, if you like, being able to resolve turbulence explicitly in, in, these, in these simulations. Next slide. But how do we know that's realistic? Well, this is where improved observing technology is crucial. And this slide summarizes a developing airborne radar remote sensing capability called the NCAR Airborne Phased Array Radar. If any of you have ever heard of uh, a phased array radar, it's a fundamentally different kind of radar from your typical sort of scanning weather radar that, say, the Weather Service uses because it does electronic scanning. And it phases the beams from, from the many different uh, uh, transmitters so that you can get wave fronts that propagate in different directions and you can effectively scan, but you do it uh, an order of magnitude faster than you can do it with a regular scanning radar. So this airplane, this is a, a schematic of how this system will look with panels on the top, sides, and bottom of a, this is an example of a C-130, NCAR has a C-130 and we're looking to put this on that aircraft that'll be able to provide observations every 400 feet as the plane flies along, which is unprecedented resolution. So if you're talking about resolving tornadoes, like Cisco was talking about, in landfalling uh, storms, the tornadoes are small. They come from small storms. You need this kind of technology to see it. If you're talking about resolving some of the turbulence that's going on in the eye wall, you need this kind of technology to be able to see it. Next slide. But there's also the larger scale. and improving hurricane prediction still rests on the backbone of numerical weather prediction globally, and that rests in turn on observations. And one of the key observations that's uh, observational advances that will be coming up is the, is the Cosmic 2 system that will be launched next year. Cosmic 1 uh, uh, has been operating, and the typical daily distribution of observations you can see by the pink dots on the top slide, that will be 
increased many fold by COSMIC-2. COSMIC-2 is a collaboration between uh, Taiwan and several U.S. agencies to launch a constellation of satellites. They use a limb scanning technique, which is uh, in this schematic on the left, where you're profiling the atmosphere and using the way radiation bends to the atmosphere in between two satellites to get an idea of the profiles. If you have enough of these profiles, you can say something about the environment of the hurricane, and that di dictates what steers the storm and other aspects of the storm as well. So this is an important advance that's coming up. And finally, hurricanes represent part of a global system of weather hazards. Now in this particular schematic on the left, I've actually shown you a typhoon, uh, which is over there by Japan. Typhoon, hurricane, same thing, just different part of the world. But just like plucking a string and watching the, watching the undulation move downstream, when this typhoon recurves into the middle latitudes, it plucks the jet stream. And the jet stream undulates and produces large amplitude deviations which are related to high impact weather across the hemisphere. So a typhoon in one place affects weather almost everywhere else. And in some cases, the weather downstream can be more severe than the typhoon itself. This requires global prediction capability, and it also requires high resolution to be able to capture the weather hazard, not, of, not only of the original typhoon, but also of the downstream impacts. And for that, we have been developing a model called the uh, Model for Prediction Across Scales, which has that capability to predict high resolution globally. And this offers a significant advance over current, current generation of global models. So to, I want to leave you with a few thoughts, <clears throat> which is, uh, and then I'll, I'll conclude here. Right now is really a, an important opportunity for the uh, advancing hazard prediction, explicit hazard prediction within hurricanes. The mix of uh, observations and models through what we call data assimilation is crucial that it advance to the point where it can take full advantage of the large number of observations that exist. But the new observations coming online are give us an opportunity to test models that we have in a way that's never been possible before. And finally, we need to think about tropical cyclones, hurricanes as global hazards and have the, the, the simulation forecasting capacity to, to reach high resolution globally. So that concludes my presentation. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Bogdan who has, who will handle questions. Thank you all very much. As advertised, we've left a whole bunch of time for you to ask those questions about hurricanes that you always wanted to, but were up to now afraid to ask. So we have microphones uh, in the room, and just grab a microphone. Uh, put your hand up if you have a question. Anything is fair game. Please tell us who you are and share your question with us. Get up here. In the cart, Cartwright office, <clears throat> a lot was uh, kind of made of wetlands uh, after Hurricane Katrina and how erosion of um, loss of sediment, you know, contributed to erosion of wetlands and that it um, made this, this, the impacts of the storm more more severe. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on how modeling can help cities and states with zoning issues, um, you know, ecological ecological restoration or like things of that nature to try to minimize the impacts of mm -hmm. um, storms. Yeah. Shui, you want to take a crack at that? Should be on when the light's on. I'll put it back. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, that's during Katrina, we learned a lot of that impact. It's very long lasting. Many tropical cyclones and hurricanes change the landscape forever. So that region did change. So as we showed in the research, fully interactive model, we actually have the ocean, water, all the river uh, regions in the model now that we can actually assess the impact of that level of impact. And that's precisely why I mentioned the application for city planning. Because in the future, many change the landscape can really impact the future of a city or region. So this model can provide you a lot more information. And like the New York Harbor area, people have taken action to look at the future projected storms and what kind of impact. And instead of waiting for these things to come, we can take the knowledge 
from now to actually projecting what we will be looking at. In the future, very minor storm can cause huge damage because the sea level rises, for instance. And those are part of uh, your question that I think we are in the position to address that. It, it's a very new and exciting area, the social sciences in the broadest sense of the word being economics, urban planning, um, management of land and water going forward, starting to interface with the meteorological and climate sciences. And this is an area that a lot of interest is now moving into as we try to take this information and decide how do we adapt to the changes we're seeing around us. And, and of course, it's a very complex problem from both sides. And we need people who are able to speak both languages that can um, you know, have the trust of, of this group of more physical sciences, but also understand the economic side of issues and the social side of issues, which are obviously very strong in land use and zoning. There are strong social, um, you know, feelings, values that are attached to how communities decide to react. In the wake of Katrina, obviously, there was lots of changes, and with Sandy as well, communities that decided maybe they would rebuild where they were, others that decided perhaps um, there was something here that told them they needed to move back towards safer and more sustainable and resilient types of properties and, and zoning. Other questions is really good. Yes, over here. Hi, I'm uh, Reba Banabadai from uh, Senator Schatz's office, and I'm a AAAS fellow. Um, I was just wondering if you would like to uh, speak a little bit to the sources of your funding for your research and how there has been, what impacts there have been over the last few years, and what do you see that, um, how do you see that impacting your ability to uh, improve and, and pro provide the kind of data and modeling that we need to, to have these kind of forecasts that we're going to need to mitigate these risks? Sitsuko, why don't you start? I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, my main uh, source of funding is generally the National Science Foundation, NSF. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we heard recently that the geosciences have been cut or might be cut with NSF, which is, which is going to impact our ability to, to get grants, to write grants as universities uh, quite dramatically. Uh, NOAA helps us with funding to an extent, not me personally, but maybe Shui can uh, speak to that a little more. Um, my research uh, funding coming from a lot of agencies like the National Science Foundation, Office of Naval Research, and also NASA, these are multi-agency funding has been supported by many of my graduate students who actually wrote these very highly uh, interactive models. So uh, research funding is absolutely critical. We cannot maintain this level of innovation without research funding. And we our research funding goes also in, uh, into educating the next generation of scientists coming into the pipeline. So these are absolutely critical. If we are really caring about our future, these research dollars are going to pay you off for a very, very long time into the future. Chris, do you want to say something about well, the National Center? Just quickly, at, at NCAR, we are funded in uh, large measure by the National Science Foundation, so everything that Sitska said about, about the threats to the National Science Foundation geoscience budget apply to funding that goes to NCAR that drives a lot of the development that we do on uh, models, observing systems, uh, so it's, it's crucial to have this uh, long-term support. Be and I emphasize long-term because uh, some of these projects like APAR is a multi-year development project. It's not something that we can do on, on one-year funding increments. It doesn't work. And so I think that's an important message that it's the sustained funding for some of these really important technology developments that's crucial. I'd, I'd add that over the last uh, three to four years, we have seen general funding levels um, decrease on average across almost all of the agencies for research in these areas. Um, interestingly enough, we also look more broadly in a sense, and I think that's something that starts to happen. So cyclones and typhoons are the same phenomena in different basins, and they can have tremendous impacts in India and Bangladesh. 
in particular, where there's a lot of lowland, um, and also obviously in the Pacific Basin. And as we start to work with a variety of different nations that have their own research activities, um, we are um, working with them, we are partnering, we're sharing ideas, we're sharing scientists, we're sharing projects that we work on together because weather, climate, hurricanes really don't care about political boundaries. The other interesting area coming back to the question here that we see is that um, obviously um, how we react to these things, foundations, um, organizations like USAID, the State Department, are increasingly taking a larger role in trying to look at the applications of this knowledge to real-world situations um, where all sorts of individuals want to try to make plans in advance um, to protect against it. So the community um, faced with some of these funding shortages has attempted to be innovative um, and look out to other areas where the knowledge and the research they're doing can bring benefit. I, I guess I might add one thing about um, the uh, language that's in the Senate uh, bill, thank you very much, uh, uh, really is very strong and supportive of the activity that we're doing here. As you know, there are um, three weather bills now floating around um, in Congress, which is totally exciting for our perspective. Uh, we have not had weather bills out there for a long time, and the fact that you're all here, I think, is really part of the interest that the nation is starting to see. So the four weather bills on the Hill, according to Tom Fahey in the back, um, so, uh, in fact, we want to thank very much the Senate for the very excellent language they have um, that we have all um, worked as a community with you to support um, the funding in the geosciences. Um, so thank you for that. Yes, uh, get a microphone back there. Hi, uh, Pete Folger with the Congressional Research Service. Um, could any of you sort of explain, if you can, how the research you're doing, the results, get incorporated or not into the official sort of forecast that the Weather Service Hurricane Center provides? And, and you know, is it a systematic kind of thing? Is it a hit or miss? Is it gradual? How, how's that work, actually? Oh, make a comment. Oh. In fact, you touch on a very, very important area that we can't emphasize enough that many research uh, a decade ago has led to a lot of current operational uh, forecast improvement, you know, like the models we're building uh, before. However, I certainly hope we can do this much more efficiently, faster than we're currently uh, able to. So in fact, two years ago when I uh, testified uh, in Congress on the w one of the weather bill, we raised that uh, very loudly to say, please, we need a certain process in place to make this happen much more effectively. So there's a lot of historical reasons why these things are not moving as fast as we can, but certainly I hope you all here uh, in the room can help us in terms of how to move that along from the research side of uh, innovation to the uh, uh, National Weather Service uh, operational forecast into the center. People are really enthusiastic, but right now I think we're lack of a really solid process in place to have that happen. So this takes a great amount of effort and will from the people on the Hill and also a lot of agencies. Believe me, all the researchers are, you know, love nothing more than having our product moved into this operational arena. Mm -hmm. Other comments from the panel on that? So I could just say that there are um, different ways technology uh, sort of infuses into operations. Uh, one project that's on, ongoing right now is the, is the R2O initiative, which is comes out of funding generated after Hurricane Sandy, is congressional funding, uh, and that is for the Weather Service to pick its next generation global prediction system. And now, I, like on my last slide, I emphasize that a global prediction system is, is dealing with hazard prediction and hurricanes are part of all of that. 
And so they're looking outside and inside to find the best technology out there. So this is, I think, represents a different way of, of going about infusing that technology. But there are a lot of other ways on kind of smaller projects. Uh, National Hurricane Center does interact with researchers. I, I think, Shu, you have, you have actually gone there, right? Um, spent some time there. Uh, and there are projects to transfer, say, uh, probabilistic forecast techniques. So it's not, so they're smaller, not the entire modeling system, but systems that, say, use the modeling system, generate specific targeted forecast products developed in the research community. Those can transition and, and operational forecasters can use those. So are there more than one way, there's more than one way to do this, but I think Shui's point is valid that the more we can do, the faster we can do it, I think it would it is going to benefit us all. Not everything is ready for prime time. So a lot of research is not ready for operations. It has to be robust, it has to be reliable, it has to be there every time, all the time, and it has to be able to deal with poor input sometimes when data systems go down. Um, what we're starting to see with the community models becoming more prevalent is when the entire planet can be trying to break your weather model, you learn a lot about it. And so increasingly we're finding interest in the um, various operational entities around the globe to trying when possible to pick open source types of models because you really do have a workforce out there that is helping you understand the limitations and the strengths of your model. We had another question up here. <clears throat> Let's pull your thread about poor input, which you just said. Um, Jamie Hawkins, Lockheed Martin, formerly with NOAA. It's repeatedly said, and it's been shown time and again, that her, uh, tropical cyclone intensity forecasting has proven harder than track forecasting. And I've also heard said recently that um, until we understand, either through observations or better observations or modeling, the uh, thermal content of the upper layer of the ocean, uh, we aren't going to make the progress we really need on intensity forecasts. Would you care to comment on that, please? Yes, um, absolutely, I agree. Um, the observing ocean is a lot harder than in some ways traditionally. So we are making progress from the uh, satellite and also some of the in-situ measurements. So now the fully interactive model we're talking about that actually have the system together with predicting the ocean as well as the atmosphere. But measuring ocean around the globe, especially the heat content, not only the, the heat content underneath hurricane, but in the climate system. So upper ocean play important role in the climate system as well. So all of that together we definitely need to have a better description of the ocean so we can understand uh, quite a bit of ocean impact on the weather and climate system. Mm -hmm. So are there quantifications of what is necessary to, to make that leap, to, to, to do better? Are there studies that say you need X, Y, and Z in order to be able to get there, not just X and Y? Or? Well, I mean, the foremost thing we have to get right is the coupling of the upper ocean, the mixed layer of the, of the upper and the wind-driven mixing and upwelling that accompany a tropical cyclone. So we're really talking about the top 100 meters in the ocean. Um, ocean, of course, ocean models and, and te techniques for modeling the full ocean are much more complicated, but it's, if that's the foremost thing we need to get right for, for prediction of hurricanes on timescales of days. When you talk about trying to go out longer and longer, then you need more and more of the ocean represented accurately to get the deep ocean circulation and how that feeds back, um, things like that. So there is, I think there is a, we know where to, where we have to focus the initial effort in, and I think we have a lot of tools existing now. The, the question is best coupling those tools together, atmosphere, wave, ocean, to, to actually improve our predictions and do it in a robust way. It's ongoing. Mm -hmm. 
we're fond of saying it's one fluid in two different densities, uh, the ocean and the atmosphere. And it's not just in hurricanes where they influence each other very strongly, but obviously as we start to look towards um, long, very long range, seasonal, interannual, um, decade time scale um, forecasting, which will, as Chris said, largely be probabilistic, but that's okay. Um, industry knows how to deal with probabilistic forecasts, and we make as a society <coughs> Um, incredibly um, costly decisions on those time scales that could be influenced by having better and tighter distributions of what those um, probabilities are. Unlike the atmosphere, the ocean is harder to observe remotely. Um, it's, it's very transparent to many of the things that we can use in the atmosphere, but scientists are spending a um, great amount of efforts trying to come up with ingenious ways, like bouncing that GPS signal off the ocean and then picking it up in the receiver um, is an interesting way to tell you something about what was happening at that bounce point. Um, being able to look at um, acoustic probing of the ocean. Sound waves are most likely the best wave to, to look at, and, and we have to you know, look at all those different ways, but that's the breakthrough we need. Other questions? Yes, one over here. Here to argue if climate change is a thing, but if climate change continues, do you think that we're going to see an increase in intensity of the storms and an increase in prevalence of superstorms like Hurricane Sandy ended up being? And these models that you're talking about, do they have the capability to better predict them? Or what research are you leaning towards doing to more accurately predict when those kinds of storms are going to happen? Yeah. Well, those are a lot of very good questions you've asked. <laughs> so I, I think uh, I can say that the, there is somewhat of an emerging consensus in the research community about um, climate change and hurricane intensity as, as let's just say, as a result of the warming ocean, uh, which is probably a reasonably good signal uh, that we have to work with uh, that, that's consistent across different uh, scenarios, uh, a warmer ocean does mean that storms can become more intense. And the, the chances of having more very intense storms are, are higher. It's, the signal is fairly weak in most of the projections that have been done. So it's not a, not a certainty, but that's a, that's a pe place people agree on. I think what people agree more on is that uh, because of the greater ocean temperature, there's going to be more water vapor in the atmosphere. Rainfall amounts will be noticeably greater from all tropical cyclones in the future. And so the inland flooding potential becomes possibly a greater risk. And then, Shu, you mentioned the... Uh, uh, Sea level rise, so even though it's not, it's not huge, it's just it's, everything is superimposed on, on top of that. So you could have exactly the same storms, but a slightly uh, higher sea level that would make, make more, uh, would be a problem. And finally, where people decide to live and density of coastal population, does, you know, even if there's no change in anything, or, could still mean a lot more impacts. Now, what are we ABA doing about predicting Sandy? Well, Sandy was a really unusual event. Yeah. So I don't think, at least I would not be prepared to say anything about whether Sandys are going to be more likely or, or not in, as we go forward. But I do think uh, to predict Sandy, you would need global modeling capabilities like we've been talking about because it's the interaction of multiple weather systems. And they come from very far apart initially, and they come together to create the, the event. You need to be able to simulate things around, around the globe for many days. So that's a global modeling capability, and we're developing that. I just want to add, uh, I don't know how many of you from the coastal state. I'm from Miami. The sea level rises is definitely impact Miami already. So given that background, um, we uh, definitely have to prepare even weaker storm than the current storm can cause equal or even greater amount of damage. So in that, with that in mind, we uh, definitely need to rethink and recalibrating how we prepare our mm -hmm. society uh, reaction to these storms. Other questions? If not, we're just right on schedule. Whoop, whoop, sorry. Wait, way in the back.
So I have a question about uh, <clears throat> what's holding, you know, what what's the rate determining factor in terms of continuing to see that downward sloping improvement in terms of models? Is it are we, do we need better models? Is it we need more computation? Do we need to incorporate new data sets? Do we need to validate existing data? If you have to set priorities, where do you see, you know, in, in the range of things that I don't even know and can't mention right now, um, where do those priorities should be to try and make sure we, we continue that more accurate forecasting as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. Well, I could take a, a initial stab at that answer. So, um, I do. One thing that's important to remember is that the aspect of the storm whose forecast you're trying to improve will say something about what technology is most important. So, for Hurricane Track, uh, Hurricane Track is largely the product of uh, global weather prediction because it's the larger scales that tend to drive that. So, we need to just get better global overall numerical weather prediction, and that involves higher resolution models, bigger computers, and better ways to assimilate all of the observations that are taken globally. But if you're talking about storm surge prediction, that's an area where a lot more development in, in the technology of how do you actually make the prediction and initialize the, the, uh, the models that do that, and the detail in those models, it's a, it's a much more local scale problem, and there's a, I think there's a lot more room for, for basic research on just how do we even do this problem uh, uh, and couple it effectively to these high resolution models. Maybe Shui has more to add about that. Yes, I agree. Um, often when you're looking at the hurricane track forecast, it is one of these bright spots we are improving that. Although um, there are certain amount of uh, limitation in the, the, the system in nature that we're probably never going to completely um, um, wipe out the error. There's going to be error if you have heard the butterfly in England might influence uh, weather in Minnesota, which is true. In that system, there's a lot of uh, uh, influence and factors that we can never really be absolute. But there are uh, rooms for improvement, especially in the area of uh, impact. That's where we are far behind than what we really like to do, which means that predicting the uh, impact of winds and rain and uh, storm surge down to street levels, and those are the area will give you much more gain in the current stage. Um, yeah, I'd like to add to that. The, when, um, when storms make landfall, that's really the critical part. That's when we're all affected. And to better understand and model those processes, land-based data are going to be crucial. And that, can be, that, that includes uh, on-the-ground observations like rain gauges, winds, and so forth. Thank you all so very much. Uh, our panel will stick around for a little bit if you want to ask them some really tough questions in private. They'll be delighted to do that. Uh, I want to remind you, we will be back here um, at the end of September for the next in our series of Science You Can Use briefings. And this one will be on what's going on in the Arctic. We expect at the very end of September to have NOAA's numbers on the ice extent, and we'll see what those numbers look like. But we'll have a panel of three experts um, who will tell us what that means and what we might expect. Thank you so much for being with us. And um, go off and stay cool today. Thank you. <laughs>